I just want to thank Rob Chap for reminding me. He said the last time I spoke on my mum's behalf, I got up and said, I've known my mum for a long time. Or <laughs> and uh, I guess that gives me a, a right to speak on her behalf. So my problem, how do you condense 93 years of a splendid existence into a few short minutes of time? Today, at best, I can only give you a glimpse of what my mother called a wonderful life that walking with destiny had delivered. History was always a fascination for mum, especially her family history, which she traced back in great detail to Sir Philip Sidney, the Elizabethan poet, scholar and soldier, whose family crest included the motto, wherever destiny takes me, a motto that she was, was to guide mum's mantra her whole life, as we shall see in her story. Mum was born on the 14th of March, 1923, and placed in the care of her nanny, Nurse Shroud, and later a much-loved nanny called Edie. She was born at her Turkey Court home that was a 36-room mansion that was attached to a paper mill where her beloved daddy was the manager. As a child, she studied dancing seriously, which was supported wholeheartedly by her father and captured so elegantly in these photo paintings that he commissioned. Now, while being the youngest person ever to be granted admission into the London School of Ballet, she chose her schooling over a dancing career and watched as her father wept before her at her decision. Thanks to some generous financial support from a relative, Mum was able to attend an exclusive private school, Ashford School for Girls, where she was a boarder for two years. She was very proficient at gymnastics, a legacy that she's passed on to many of her children and grandchildren. One reoccurring theme in Mum's life it is evidence in, on closer inspection of the school photo, revealing an incessant smile and a twinkle in an eye that was to be her lifelong trademark. Mum successfully completed the university entrance exam, but war intervened and she was not able to realise her dream of a university degree at either Oxford or Cambridge. Mum's father wanted her to go into the paper mill business with him and so he encouraged her to enrol in a business school. But with the Battle of Britain raging overhead and experiencing the horror of bombs dropping on London and surrounding countryside, Mum decided to register at the Air Force Recruiting Office in November 1941. Once more, her dad was devastated. She was put into training to operate radar, which was a new top secret technology at the time and gave England a significant advantage in the war effort. After some time with radar, Mum was offered a commissioned officer's position in signals. Unsure whether to take it or not, she consulted her dad, who offered the following advice, which she has followed her entire life. Whenever a door opens up before you, through no effort of your own, you should always walk through it. She took his advice and her life had a dramatic turn. While being initially posted to the famous British Dam Buster Squadron, she was swapped with an Air Commodore's daughter who didn't want to take up an allocated posting or her allocated posting with the Australians at 460 Squadron in Brimbrook. She had no sooner arrived on the squadron in November 1944 than she was invited to attend a Sunday afternoon get-together between the WAFs and the Aussie Airmen. Count me out, she said. But her hand was forced by her commanding officer just as it had been for Dad, who was equally reluctant given his recent loss of a friend in a raid. Now what happened at this first meeting is meticulously recorded in Mum's diary, where she describes this moment as the supreme coming together of Quo Vata Vecon, wherever destiny takes me. As fate would have it, Mum and Dad were sitting together when the light suddenly went out. Within the comfort of a room filled with the lights of that mesmerising flickering fire, Two people from two different worlds found something in common. Mum's diary records their parting on that particular day and I quote, As he turned around and said, Goodbye Anne, I thought to myself, that's the strangest proposal of marriage I've ever received. <laughs> he of course thought nothing of it. But for me, the net had been thrown and I had been caught. For the next three months, I fell more and more in love with this rascal of a man. He delighted me in every way, and I knew right from the start that indeed Loch Navarre had ridden in from the west. 
The epiphany for Dad happened at the barbed wire fence while picking holly with Mum in the woods, a moment that has been spoken about at great length around the Baskerville dinner table. Mum explains the event in, the, in her diary. At one point we came across a barbed wire fence. I didn't give it a second thought. I just cocked my leg, leant down and went through it. Henry said to me later, when you went through the fence like that, I thought, that's the girl I'd like to marry. So much for the Mills and Boone romance. <laughs> Dad has always emphasised that it was her direct, no-nonsense approach to problem solving that attracted him to her. But Mum has always suspected that a glimpse of her navy blue Air Force issued bloomers may have had a lot more to do with it than he cares to admit. <laughs> By the time they had met, Dad was only halfway through his tour. Now Mum had a special interest in Dad's remaining 15 bombing missions. She saw Dad's plane, O for Obo, as her main rival because it had the capacity to take her loved one away from her, as was the case for a squadron with one of the highest casualty rates of any Australian wartime unit. During their early courtship, Mum asked Dad for the date of his birthday. Straight-faced, he replied, 14th of March, 1923. Being Mum's birthday, she thought it was the cheekiest pickup line she'd ever heard. <laughs> As it turned out, they were actually born both on exactly the same day, two worlds apart. One night, Mum looked at the returning notice board and saw that all their crews had returned but one, Dad's. When he finally landed and then walked with a cheeky grin into that debriefing room, he got both barrels of Mum's anguish and concern. Mum had found her sweet prince and she was determined to hang on to him and follow him to the end of the earth if needs be. They got engaged in London and then went to Mum's home to discuss the situation with Mum's parents. Mum says that her parents seemed a little dazed. I'm not sure an Aussie airman from the colonies was quite what they were hoping for their daughter. Dad, sensing the disquiet, did as he does, dug his toes in. Well, young man, do you have any money? No, came the quick reply. Do you have a job? No. Dad deliberately building the tension. Mum stepped in quickly looking for a solution to the impasse, which arrived when everyone agreed that Dad should go back to Australia, get a job, and if they both still felt the same way in 12 months' time, then Mum's father would give the union his blessing. And that's what they did. During the 12 months apart, Mum's father wrote to Dad's dad about his concerns with the union, and the reply came written on original Turkey Mill paper because he was the CEO of the South East Queensland Electrical Authority and they used nothing but the best paper. Not so colonial after all. One year later, Mum sent a cable. Just that. Do you want me to come? Why wouldn't you? This is Dad's reply. And how. So he didn't waste a lot of money on that cable. So at age 23... Mum was once more entrusting her life to the mantra of wherever destiny takes me and set out by boat to join her sweet prince in Australia. Mum says that while her mother positively said, you're going to sunshine, Mum's father didn't speak for months. Dad took Mum back to the family home at Wavell Heights. Mum was surprised that everyone at home called him Alan rather than Henry because Alan was his real name but being typically Aussie mates, they thought his middle name was far more interesting. Now, Mum was brought up as a strict Church of England and was confronted by Nana at the first cup of tea that they shared with the question, do you believe in the second coming? Mum puts in her diary, I didn't know what on earth she was talking about. Nana also thought that Dad should have married a doctor's daughter and reminded Mum often of this fact. But regardless of this obsession with a doctor's daughter, Mum honoured Nana all the days of her life. And she says in her diary, I received full reward for their honour and patience all those years when Nana finally declared in her later years that she loved Mum. They were married 8th of February 1946 at All Saints Church, Brisbane. It's a love affair that lasted 70 years and only ended a few minutes after Dad's last visit to her in the nursing home last Saturday. Mum was close to Gonga. For those that don't know who Gonga is, it's the name that Margaret could come up with when trying to pronounce Grandad. The closest she could come up with was Gonga, and the name stuck, and it's now been adopted by his eldest grandson, David. Mum was with Gonga the day he died, and she spoke of the privilege of being there 
at the passing of such a great man. A feeling shared by Tom and me as we sat with our mum at her passing last Saturday. Mum says in her diary, I had two ready-made sisters in Betty and Amy. They were wonderful. She spoke often of her complete acceptance into the basketball clan, a practice she herself has played forward to many others down through the decades. Mum became pregnant in May 47, went to the doctor she called Harpo Marx, who delivered all Mum's children except me. There's a theme building here. <laughs> Mum says that Mags was just beautiful, but the relatives and Nana spoiled her as if she belonged to them. She was Mum's little character, which she nicknamed Chirpy. David was pink and fair and cried from the moment he was born. Mags became his official spokesperson. And up until the age of three, all he could say was eh and eh. eh. Mum says in her diary, I thought he was deaf. <laughs> but Mags used this to advantage, especially when it came to David saying, or interpreting David saying, is I didn't want the ice cream and you should give it to Mags. <laughs> How you got out, that out of eh, eh, I don't know, but Mags was able to do it. Helen was born 27th of May 1953. During the pregnancy, Mum took up knitting. And it says in her diary, knit one, pearl one, ouch, drop one. <laughs> Helen she described as an easy and delightful baby, happy and gurgly, and getting the middle name Elizabeth because she arrived on Queen Elizabeth's coronation day. Harpo Marx tried to give me, this is from Mum, Harpo Marx tried to give me some birth control. But too late, Peter was already in place. <laughs> Peter was my little white Sambo. Now you know where you get it from. Due to the quickness of his birth, the bones of his skull had been sharpened to a point, like a dunce cap. I think that explains a lot. My sunny little son, Tom, was always a joy to me. He had a sunny, loving and happy nature and was sensitive to the needs of others. Mum says, sorry guys, that she enjoyed Pip more than any of the others. <laughs> he never gave us any trouble and became very attached to me. When I brought him home from hospital, David says, put him in my room and that's where he stayed. Mum was very fond of this quote. She would go around to everyone that, were, that existed and said, what I love about my family is that there's not a dud one amongst them. We managed to keep this photo away from her because she may have changed her mind. <laughs> when Margaret and David were toddlers, Mum returned to England. Dad paid one way and Mum's dad the other. She went with Amy, Auntie Amy, who met her prince, Uncle Keith, on the same boat. It was a severe English winter, but Mum's dad had managed to fill the house full of flowers that he had forced grown in the cellar. Daddy was so overjoyed to see me and the children who were a delight to them both. When Mum returned from cold England, she proclaimed Brisbane as the most wonderful climate in the world. You can imagine why. Soon after returning, the family went to Point Lookout, Stradbroke Island on holidays, a place Mum describes as no electricity, no toilet, no hot water, no telephone, no bitcher, one small shop. But a love affair had begun and it remained a love affair for her entire life. Mum puts in her diary and she said, it was fun, fun, fun. That's how she describes Strabroke. And I think those of us that have been there uh, would totally agree. In 1952, Dad got a bank transfer to Nambour, where they purchased their first car, for some reason they called Jalopy. It was a 1924 Oldsmobile with wooden wheels, canvas hood, no windows, that trembled as we went along. And as you can sort of see in the photo, the dog went along as well. It was here that her life took another dramatic turn with a knock on the door by the pastor of the Wumbai AOG, Fred Lancaster, and now armed with a Gideon Testament given to him in his war service, and with instructions from Pastor Lancaster and Harold Bartholomew, Dad became a born-again Christian, and Mum soon followed. In 1956, Mum and Dad returned to Brisbane and settled in Woolawan. Dudley Holland, my wife's grandfather, picked them up each Sunday and took them to the tab. The Woolawan home was often used as a resting place for returning missionaries, uh, like the Hollands, the Meadows and the Enwiches. The concept of Mum's home being compared to Central Station had begun. Mum and Dad both felt called to help out the Fullwoods in the fledgling church at Cooper's Plains. 
It was here they stayed for many years and where mum became a Sunday school teacher to the 12 year old girls like Marion Boyd. These girls, now grown up and married, would often recall mum's practical Sunday school tips. Put the tablecloth on the table before your husband comes home, even if you haven't cooked anything. He'll think the meal is just not too far off. Oh, and don't forget to comb your hair, put on a nice dress, give him a big smile and a hug as he comes through the door. These are a recipe for great living, no doubt, but with little scripture verses to back them up. Didn't seem to bother mum. In the early days, there were very few people in the congregation, and those that were were mostly Baskervilles. On one occasion, David and Margaret were missing. This is Mum's diary. I looked out the window to see them letting down Henry's tyres. <laughs> I mentioned this to the preacher, Henry, who promptly went to the window, yelled at the kids to stop what they were doing, and then went straight back to his preaching. <laughs> Mum talks fondly of the fellowship with so many people at Cooper's, including Howard and Sybil, Wally and Flo, the boys, and uh, Del Robinson Evans, who was Gonga's secretary. In 1960, Daddy died. It was a shock because no one told her of his cancer. I suspect this was under the father's instructions. She was devastated but saved by an, an angel, Auntie Phil, who was to provide great comfort and practical help to her in the raising of six children. In 1962, Dad was transferred to Rockhampton, where a lifelong friendship developed with the Mitchells, including Esther, her twin Evan and Ruth. They were as crazy and fun-loving as the Baskervilles and could see the funny side of things like Mrs. Cronin's rather awkward baptism that caused a tidal wave through the church. It's here that Mum talks about being stuck in the toilet and having to pull out the levers to get to the outside of the house and then having to shimmy down the drain pipe to escape from her high-set prison. She reflects in the diary about how that must have looked to the neighbours. Look at that strange neighbour. She goes to the Assemblies of God, you know. In 1964, Mum and Dad returned to Brisbane and lived in a variety of places, including on top of the Commonwealth Bank, interesting, and at Daddy Goff's. Meanwhile, a builder from the tab, Tommy Wright, built their home at the Gap, including the critical component of a fireplace, which, while out of place in Brisbane's humid climate, was not so for this English lass. It was here that Mum and the basketball clan forged a close friendship with Mrs Arnold and the Arnold football and cricket team. When Mum's sister Jo was diagnosed with terminal cancer, she came out to visit us in Australia. It was a joyous time, mended Mum's relationship with her only sibling. While at the Gap, and with her children now growing up, Mum had more time to devote to other interests. She ran the Teen Challenge bookshop in Newmarket and worked at the Salvos, where she demonstrated her special gift of being able to sort the uh, wheat from the chaff and knowing how to price the donated goods profitably. Mum followed Dad in into joining the Gideons. After many years of devotion to the cause, she was made the national chaplain and then became the national president of the Women's Auxiliary, a role she held with great distinction. The head of the AOG church at the time, Andrew Evans, rang Dad one afternoon and invited him to take up a position of administrator at the Commonwealth Bible College in Katoomba Blue Mountains. Dad was keen, but Mum realised the cost of being separated from her beloved family that was mostly settled in and around Brisbane. But in following her sweet prince once more, and letting destiny have its way, they moved to Wentworth Falls. Mum occupied herself with her garden and applying her business skills and the running of the college bookshop, much to the angst of the lecturers. Now while it was far away from Mum's Brisbane family, it was a godsend for me and my family that had settled in Sydney. The weekend trips to the Blue Mountains every second week was something that was cherished by Mum and my family alike. And Mick has flown up here to, from Sydney today to join, in, join us with that celebration. After eight years in the Blue Mountains, Mum and Dad moved back to Brisbane and settled in Hillcrest, a home they have lived in for 27 years. And they found fellowship right here at Parklands. Finally, she was back in her world, surrounded by the family that she loved. And she says, until it hurts. There were 23 grandchildren to play with and, and adore. While her upbringing and Englishness could never allow herself to indulge in any scallywag activities, she enjoyed it immensely, immensely when we did and participated vicariously. She attended every possible event where her grandchildren were involved. She loved nothing more than to be in the company of the family that she loved. 
The effervescent smile and twinkle in her eye were her trademark features always. As Mum got older, the trips out of the house became less and less. But the inbound visitors were what Mum described as being like parked in the middle of Central Station. Endless visitors wanted to share in the warmth. With the help of the family, particularly Mags and Helen, and the wonderful and caring support of the RSL in-home care team, Mum was able to live in her own home for 92 years and 11 months. Now, while the advancing dementia robbed Mum of much, she invested every second of her lucid moments in telling us kids that she loved us and thanking the carers for their work. Eventually, Mum's condition, medical condition, required us to put her in care so she could access it 24-7. After four weeks at our care and just one week shy of her 93rd birthday, she slipped the surly bonds of earth and touched the face of God. So what became of a life dedicated to the mantra of whatever, wherever destiny takes me? I believe her life stands as an exemplar for how living should be done. Her diaries provide the recipe for a life well lived. With courage to follow your destiny, surrounded always by fun, laughter and joy. A life where love is expressed as a commitment to your sweet prince and where your religion is good deeds. A life where gratitude becomes your primary reason to speak while in, embedded firmly in a family where you love them and you tell them incessantly. It's a life built on, built on coping with whatever befalls, of enduring every trial and ultimately overcoming triumphantly every ill. Mum's goal wasn't to live forever. Her goal was to create something that will. We often joke about it when we were talking about Mum and Mum was talking about people about the care she had for so many people. She really was the mother of all the world. Mum signs off in her diary. For myself, I am so appreciative of the way the lines of my life have fallen in pleasant places. I remember always a happy childhood, cherished and loved by both my parents. I have wonderful memories of a lifelong romance with that rascal Henry. And I look around now at each of my children and their partners and every one of my 23 quiver-filled, lively grandchildren, and how I love them all, until it actually hurts. Her life may have ended, but her legacy has just begun. The words her forebear, Sir Philip Sidney, spoke as he lay dying are equally appropriate to our mum today. Love my memory. We will, Mama. We certainly will. Thank you.